everyone. So welcome back to our now fifth episode of the podcast Doorway to Discovery. We're so excited to be recording and we're so happy uh, that you're all listening. So this week we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of queer books and we're all so excited. This is something that is really close to our hearts and like we've been discussing this episode since we decided let's do a podcast. So been in the works for a minute. Yeah, so let's get started. I'm going to be talking about Neil Patrick Harris's The Magic Misfits. It is a middle grade fiction, uh, preferably for eight to 12 year olds. Uh, The first book follows Carter. This is him right here, the little blonde boy. Um, And he, his parents essentially disappear one day and he's sent to live with his uncle, uh, who's uh, a con artist, but he's like a small con con artist. So he like steals people's money by playing games like on the street. Um, And he hates it. He thinks it's such a terrible way to live. He doesn't have a home. They live in halfway houses. Um, He essentially lives on the streets and he runs away and he runs away to this tiny little town and he meets um, this magician there called um, Mr. Vernon, I believe. And through a sequence of events, you start to see other people in the town. He starts to meet other kids that are around his age and they all have special magic abilities. So I think his is... um, the ability of sleight of hand. Um, And when he goes to meet Mr. Vernon in his shop, you find out that he has an adoptive daughter and he's actually married to a man. So they are a gay couple with a adopted daughter and they're actually the main characters of the second book. So each of the kids in this story get their own book and you kind of experience their, what their lives are like and what, you know, new kind of thing is going on. Um, I will say that I have not gotten to the end of the book yet, um, but I'm really absolutely adoring it so far. Um, The way that Neil Patrick Harris approaches these subjects, because not only is there a child who's adopted, uh, but she also has gay dads. And then there's also a child who is in a wheelchair. um, And all of the ways that they interact with these difficult issues are amazing. Whether it's um, the little girl who she comes up in a a wheelchair and Carter meets her. She's like, yep, I'm in a wheelchair. You want to ask me about it? You're going to get a bloody nose like just love it or like yep I have two dads and he's like oh wow I have no dads like what is this like it's one of the best things is that it's not the driving point of the book it's just a part of their lives which is the way that we all live our our daily lives anyways and I think it shows kids that there is diversity out there and this is how you act when you come into interaction with it right like you don't judge somebody based on their lives just who they are as a person and that's what carter does he definitely sees people for who they are um, and loves them for who they are and i think that's super amazing but what i also loved about this book because you know it's so difficult to get kids to read sometimes um, is not only is it a compelling story about magic um, real and ones that you just kind of like do on your own um, but it's also, there's little hidden things throughout the book. Um, there's little codes. And one of the things that I love, cause everybody gets tired part of the way through the book, you know, Patrick Harris will just be like, Oh, hi, we just did a magic trick. Do you want to learn it? And then he teaches you the magic trick, which I think is kind of amazing. Um, but then he is also really great at using bigger words and then explaining them to kids. Um, mm-hmm. which is what I love is that, yes, he's going to use a word like vagabond, but then he's going to directly say like, this is what it means. And this is what it means in this context. And I love it because it's teaching kids new words. But the other thing that I really love that I wanted to talk about was, he mentions libraries so often. Carter constantly goes to libraries, constantly talks about like the resources you can find in a library and that he feels safe there. And I just absolutely loved it. Um, And then one other thing is that Neil Patrick Harris also does the audio books for them, which I got on Audible and I'm going to listen to tonight because I'm so excited because Neil Patrick Harris is amazing. Um, And I just think he is so great because he is out as um, bisexual and he has his family. And I just live up to, you know, their Halloween costume game like amazing yeah yeah (laughs) so I love him he has been such an amazing um person and such an amazing advocate that it's just so amazing to see him write a book that's also equally as amazing but also something you can give to your kids to also learn how to interact with people that are not like you in public and and just as a person and show like this is such an amazing kid who just wants to have a family and a life and it doesn't matter what these people's lives are like it's just who they are as a person and I think that's one of the best things about the book I love that yes 
love it too. Oh, I'm gonna it's read so it sweet. and buy it. That for sounds my so nieces. good. Everybody should. That's Honestly, sweet. it's so good. I think it, this one came out in 2018, and each of them gets their own book. So I know Lila's is next, and it's about um, her birth parents showing up. Um, and her internal struggle with dealing with the fact that these people are her birth parents and she'd been adopted by two dads and her background is that she grew up in an orphanage and she's an escape artist um, because she was always trying to escape because she didn't want to be in an orphanage and she was left there as a child so um, it's amazing that she kind of found dads that support that in her that yes you want to escape but let's do it in a creative way in magic and I think that one will be super amazing to listen to and read as well oh I love it yeah it's so that's sweet. really sweet I feel like there's something like very queer about that, about like, let's turn this like painful event of your past into a hobby. Yes. And I think that's like really empowering. And I think that's like, it's really Mm -hmm. cool that that kids have these kind of books because I remember like when I was a kid, I think like, I guess middle grade, uh, Pretty Little Liars. Yeah. I mean, maybe grade seven was a little young to start reading that. But it was the first book I read that had a queer character. Emily. So, Emily, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And even Emily, Emily like, is very problematic in herself, too, right? And there's yeah. a lot that goes on in Pretty Little Liars. Honestly, we should, I want to kind of talk about that, actually. But um, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about Pretty Little Liars in that sense, because then you have the TV show where in the book, it was such mm-hmm. a big deal that she was, Emily was white. And her parents were racist because she yeah. met a girl and she fell in love with a girl who was a person of color and her parents didn't want her to be with her because she was a person of color. And then in the TV show, they made the choice to make Emily a person of color herself so they can completely remove that narrative. And yeah. I'm so happy that they did because it was such a terrible narrative to have. Yeah. Like to also have them be against her, like because she was also religious, I believe in the books too. There's, yeah. there's a whole thing with Emily, but yeah. yes, like this book, I started to read it and I didn't really know what I was, I didn't know what to expect, honestly. And at first I didn't even realize it was Neil Patrick Harris. I just saw it pop up on the, it keeps coming in at the library. And I was like, cool, I'm going to check this book out, see what it's like. And Kate's like, oh, that's Neil Patrick Harris. And I was like, oh my God, Neil Patrick oh, Harris. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this book teaches so many important lessons to kids in a very subtle way. That's also very fun. And that's what you need in books it's just simple fun books that don't necessarily show like they have each of these kids has trauma but this is what they do to get over it and how they have an outlet and you know what I mean like that's so important like yes Carter's struggling with the fact that he has no family that he's homeless but these are the things that he does to make himself feel at home and to find a family and like overcome the trauma that he's facing and I think that's that's so amazing to still have in the narrative but it's such a fun book that you don't feel like you're dealing with such a hard topic yeah yeah absolutely and Shelby I think you you get at this kind of every week but the importance of not just having diversity but like having having stories where people can just like live their lives and like yeah. there can be joy but there can also be pain but it doesn't have to be driven by that so yeah 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 I think a lot of queer lit is driven by trauma and like the sadness behind it and I know I think we've talked talked about it previously at yeah the black month history month in here but mm-hmm. um especially when it comes to female and female romances, like it tends to always end like terribly. And it's just one of the saddest things I can think of because people's lives don't end terribly every day. Like we fall in love and that should be just the main premise is the fact that we fall in love and we love people. Like that's the, the very basic thing in humanity is to find somebody that you love. So why why treat it as something that's going to be traumatic or sad, like just have a beautiful love story. Like that's sometimes all we need. And that's why a lot of us read these romances that are queer is because we want to see queer people have happy romances and yeah. end up together and love. And it's just such a simple concept to me. Mm-hmm. And be yeah. accepted. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important to have that role model and see, you know, like see yourself in a book and see like, oh, I'm not going to meet someone. And then they're either going to be like killed off by the author or, you know, like any, any host of terrible things that it does happen a lot. But yeah, yeah, it's so great to highlight the ones that don't do that. But enough about me and my book. Let's move on to the the next one because (laughs) we have so many things to talk about. I'm sorry. I definitely am a talker. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. I mean, hey, great segue into um, my book here, Something to Talk About, uh, by Meryl (laughs) Wilsner, which is two women who fall in love. (laughs) Uh, And it's happy. (laughs) Um, So this book, um, it follows Joe, Joe Jones, um, which is like a great stage name. Um, 
She is a TV writer, um, transitioning into being a movie writer. Um, she's starting to write an action movie at the beginning of this book, which is really cool. Um, and her assistant, Emma. Um, so basically, the book opens with the two of them going to the SAG Awards. And Joe asks Emma to come to the SAG Awards with her because she doesn't want interviewers to ask her questions about her new um, script that she's writing about this new action movie because a lot of people are being like oh you're a woman what do you know about writing an action movie so she's like I don't want to deal with that come with me and then you can like keep everyone from asking me questions but then it turns into um, paparazzi rumor mill that <laughs> Emma and Joe are dating and that's why they were at the SAG Awards together and um, there's pictures of them like smiling at each other and they're like oh we should deny this and um, Joe says, no, why would we deny it? Nothing's happening. It'll die down on its own. It doesn't. <laughs> um, and so it sparks like this whole rumor mill. And there's actually a really funny moment when Joe says, oh, wow, this is the first time in history, I think, that a, two women have been photographed together and are not called gal pals, um, oh. which was very funny. I was like, oh, yes. yeah, true. Like, if this was happening, like, actually, people were like, oh, Joe Jones and her best friend, Emma um so yeah I thought that was really funny that it was kind of flipped that and she was like oh look we're not gal pals this time um so yeah very funny they actually you know over the course of this start realizing like oh do I actually have feelings for this person um and it brings up a lot of issues because Joe is Emma's boss um and so there's a lot of issues that way but you know love finds a way it's fiction <laughs> and romance oh, yeah. so that I always wonder about female romances is that the culture of women is very different than men and so like you are always very affectionate with women yeah. like other women we're all very affectionate like you know you hold your best friend's hand while you're out in public like you hug you, you tell each other you love each other like sometimes it's very difficult to see a romance where women are already like that in general so it's how do you have that distinction between oh, I'm actually in love with you, like on a romantic level, not just in a friend way. So that's why I find like female romances so important is because you don't get to see women in that way. And it's so hard for women, especially growing up to be like, is this my own thing that I'm experiencing where I'm actually in love with this person? Or is this just the way that we interact with each other? And something as simple as this, where you might not know that you're out of the closet because one of them is, is in the closet still, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's a really hard interaction to have, even just on a woman basis. And then to also be in the workplace, that's like, well, yeah, that's yeah. majorly something that Joe deals with because there's um, a point where um, they're walking together and Joe like puts her hand on Emma's shoulder and she's like, oh, do I, is that because I like her or is that because <laughs> I always, and then she like fully goes into like, looking into every she's like do I always put my hand on her shoulder or is this because I have a crush now and it's just it's really funny to be like in her head because Joe is also very much um she's very like calculated and very like poised and this is just everything is the way that I want it to be and so then she just gets completely flustered about Emma and it's very funny um just to, like be in her head when she's like oh no is this love um the yeah. dreaded l word <laughs> right it, it was quite fun um but yeah I really love this book I found for me um the last few books that I read before this one I wasn't really into like a lot of them I'd be like okay that was okay um not my favorite and then I finally got to this one and I was like wow a book that I really loved excellent I I like books still like, yeah, yeah. Feeling. When you're like, like a little bit do stressful. I hate them all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what I'm right now I went into, I was reading a lot of new stuff that I wasn't loving. So I went and started like rereading some books that mm. I loved because, you know, I needed. Yeah, I did that. I needed something that I really enjoyed. And then I found this one. So it was good. Oh, that's the best feeling. It just makes the book like even better. Right. And the oh, audio book yeah. is on who is on Libby because I have it on whole. Sweet. I have it checked out on Libby right now. So the book is available online if you want. Yes. To Amazing. Ebook and the audiobook format. <laughs> Accessibility for the win. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right, it's me. Yeah. Um, so, Hi, Kate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm awake. <laughs> um, so for this episode, I was 
so torn. I had so many books that I wanted to talk about. I, I absolutely love queer fiction and fiction that just features queer characters. Like, um, for example, I, this could be a whole tangent on its own, but Marrow Thieves has probably the best yeah. casual gay representation I have ever read in my life. And that author, Sheree uh, Dimeline, she also has a short story out in uh, an anthology called Love Beyond Body, Space and Time, which is an Indigenous queer anthology that you should definitely read. But anyway, that's a whole digression. But <laughs> so I had a lot of books that I wanted to choose from. So I decided to go a different direction and talk about queer poetry today. So I would say that my three favorite queer poets are Dion Brand, Emily Dickinson and Billy Ray Belcourt. So both Billy Ray Belcourt and Dion Brand are Canadians, by the way. Uh, you can find, I, I don't actually have any physical copies of Dion Brand's poetry, but look her up, she's fabulous. She does a lot of stuff about Toronto as well as um, like relationships and that kind of stuff. And her poems are just beautiful. Uh, but the one that I really wanna especially plug today is Billy Ray Belcourt's collection, This Wound is a World. I read it for a course in university and my prof said, poetry, you shouldn't just read it, you should read it aloud. Poetry is meant to be heard, not just read. So I actually read this whole anthology to my friend um, <laughs> or like big my parts heart. of it. Yeah, I love and, that. What uh, a good friend. Oh, sweet. <laughs> oh, I know they put up with a lot. That <laughs> I was just like, hey, can I read this entire book to you? And they were like, sure. <laughs> um, so I would like to read a part of a poem to you, listeners and to friends. So this one is called uh, Gay Incantations. So I fall into the opening between subject and object and call it a condition of possibility. When I speak, only the ceiling listens. Sometimes it moans. If I have a name, let it be the sound his lips make. There is no word in my language for this. Sometimes my kukum begins to cry and a world falls out. Grieve is the name I give to myself. I carve it into the bed frame. I am make-believe. This is an archive. It hurts to be a story. I am the boundary between reality and fiction. It is a ghost town. You dreamt me out of existence. You are at once a map to nowhere and everywhere. Yesterday was an optical illusion. I kiss a stranger and give him a middle name. I call this love. It lasts for exactly 20 minutes. I chase after that feeling, which is to say, I want to almost not exist. So that's not all of that poem, but you should read it. Um, okay, and all so had, did anyone else when they were like 20 ever just fall in love with a stranger on a bus for like an hour? Because I feel really? like that <laughs> really represents that. <laughs> it lasted for 20 minutes. Like, yeah, I get that. Yeah. 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 I know I just I that that poem I read it like after I read it out loud the first time I read it like four more times just to myself just because I just I love it so much and that whole book is phenomenal so I highly recommend that one and I also would like to plug the poetry of Emily Dickinson 19th century lesbian poet speaking of gal pals she's another <laughs> person that was about for so long it's just like oh that funny lady that liked to live on her own <laughs> <You know? laughs> with her roommate like no <laughs> come on yeah yeah I hate that with the roommate yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, her I very know. close friend of 50 years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they died in the same bed <laughs> that's just died like in the same bed excuse me like, <laughs> did anyone else think of new girl and schmidt and his mom like my mom's yes. close personal friend susan like uh, <laughs> no for 25 years chill <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah i actually exactly. went a little bit darker i don't know how many people took like so, um sociology in school but was my major so yeah. yeah there we go the bystander <laughs> effect yeah um and so mm -hmm. this it's a certain case that they're talking about is a woman who like she died in the stairwell she's, and she's and there's another one who's like stabbed on the street 
too. He, he came back. He like yeah attempted to kill her, and then he came back and finished the job, and nobody in any of the apartment buildings said anything. Um, yeah, and, and like something it, like thirty three people watched it happen, and like nobody called nine one one. Yes, they all assumed somebody else would. Somebody yeah. else was going to do it. Yeah, but yeah. interestingly enough, I think what we they didn't look at, and what a lot of people didn't look at, is there's actually um, a new documentary that came out, or he was on Doctor Phil. I can't remember. I'll send you guys the the name of it. But I listened to Bailey Syrian on YouTube, and she was talking about it, and oh, yeah, I love her. They actually said there's a a very vague other thing going on, essentially. And they call, they said that she is actually, uh, she's a lesbian and she had called this person who was her best friend um, and roommate. That's what they all called her. She was her roommate and best friend, but that was actually her lesbian lover. Mm -hmm. And she was in the apartment when it happened. And so something as simple as that, where they're like, oh, like her roommate was there like then we don't Mm -hmm. represent that person who just lost the love of their life because not only is it like oh like no that's not my roommate my best friend like that's the person I'm in love with that's the person I'm supposed Mm -hmm. to have my life with but it's it's something like like that too that can really change the way that we view a situation because there was so many other things going on in that specific situation that now we all learn oh it's the bystander effect like they all thought somebody else was calling but when in fact like know the people who were living in that apartment building were part of a certain group of people who had come over from Germany who didn't want to get involved in the law at the time because it's New York City at a certain period in time and they didn't yeah. want to get in trouble like all of these things like add up to us mm-hmm. making an assumption about a person and completely erasing their storyline so now this which is huge because lost- guaranteed if there was a male in that apartment they would have been like boyfriend fiance yeah. husband and then you feel like it's still a horrible story like I remember it for learning about it in school it's still an awful story that shouldn't ever happen to anyone but then you know if she had a male partner you would also feel that sense of loss for that partner yeah but mm-hmm. instead they're just like oh her roommate and you're like oh that sucks she lost her yeah. friend but no like that was her partner like that's a mm-hmm. that's a sense that's a story that still deserves to be told yeah and this mm-hmm. person like they lost someone and that's a story there and they're also erasing the fact that this person was queer right like that identity that they are is now being erased from their storyline and look at now we learn about it every any person who's been in any kind of sociology class now learns the story and does not know who she is I did not know that she was queer when I I learned about that but that was a few years ago (laughs) yeah and this is a a, a like definitely it's newer and they're like no you need to look at the situation again because what they were telling you is wrong and yeah that right there is detrimental to her as a person and it makes me so sad to think that we all just assume that this is the way that it was and it's not true. So something as simple as calling someone your gal pal or your roommate is is devastating to somebody who's in love with that person who they just lost. Like, yeah. anyways, that's yeah. my that's, little rant of the day. I think you well, that's, that's a fine line to walk to when we're talking about like, we like casual gay representation too. It's like, it's nice to just have queer characters be in a story, but it's also nice to like treat their storyline separately as well and talk about what being gay meant to their lives and what happened like you know Mm -hmm. her being gay might not be incidental to that story you know the bystander effect right like if someone knew they might not they might care less about her life you know exactly so it's like it's important to look at both yeah queer stories as just stories but also as queer stories because they can be be traumatizing yeah. yeah, it would also be yeah. nice if we could get to a point where like we can have both kinds of stories. Yeah, exactly. And it just like work yeah. itself in, right? Yeah. You can have the big story, the coming out story, the um, you know, the trauma, the b- growing from it, but you can also have like the really nice casual of it too, casualness. Exactly. Yeah, and, and I think we're getting there. Though. Yeah, we're getting yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of both. I think just the sheer volume of the what we read in queer lit. Yeah should show that it's definitely becoming more and more mainstream and we expect it it's not only that it's something that we want it should be expected like there should be diversity there should be at least one character who's queer because i'm sorry you walk into any building and anybody who's out and comfortable you're like how many people nowadays are are queer like a lot of people are queer it's not like oh my neighbor from 70 years ago was definitely gay like (laughs) i'm sorry lived with their roommate yeah (laughs) close personal friend (laughs) <laughs> and this generation that's coming up because it's part of their lives and it's accepted. Like, I wonder what the statistics are nowadays on what the newer generations are identifying as. Like, do you think that this new generation is more queer? Because yeah, they to be. exactly. Well, it's, and it's, that's what it is. It's yeah. so much safer to mm-hmm. say who you are, which is and there's a bigger community that can like mm-hmm. 
make you feel safe, right? It's not as difficult. It's not like they're going to come into a bar and shut you down because you're gay anymore. Like, that's not what happens. I mean, it still does happen. I'm not going to sit here and lie to your faces and be like, that doesn't happen anymore. Like, but it's not as common and it's illegal to do. It's not legal. Like it used to be. Yeah. Right. So well, depending on where you are in the world, in where we are currently in our society in Ontario, we're, we're doing okay. Like we're never going to be fully okay with what happened, but I think I'm so happy that it is the way it is. And people are a lot more comfortable being who they are nowadays because it's, it's so important for us to feel okay with who we are as people. Yeah, absolutely. Because there can be a lot of shame and it can be really hard to like, to come to terms with like yourself when the media is telling you horrible things. So I think the media is just like immensely important. The language we use is so important. And yeah, yeah, like language is like the hill I will die on. Like yeah I did English in undergrad but like it's it's just so important because yeah as you're saying like gal pals like um sapphic sisters bosom buddies like all of these things like I use them because they're hilarious and like I'm queer so like I'm allowed but (laughs) when like straight people go around saying those things they're really damaging yeah 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 well that and language kind of kills me so like that's the other thing like I, I don't identify as queer but I try to identify myself as an ally because I just think like rep, you know people are people just don't be mean like, <laughs> yeah. come on the golden rule uh, yeah just be nice come on but it's also it costs you zero dollars and zero effort just to use language that make people comfortable right mm-hmm. and I feel like if you go out of your way if you like somebody has requested for you know for the example of like please use the word queer instead of gay just because that's what they prefer or please call me they instead of she or he um it, it's like no effort just be like yeah sure no problem. Like, they, whatever exactly and if you purposely go the opposite way that means you're mean <laughs> yeah okay it does <laughs> even if you mess up like people are going to realize that you're messing up and that's okay you, you have to change mm-hmm. the way your verna- your vernacular the chosen way that you speak is right we're all learning new ways yeah. when somebody identifies as a different type of gender that we're not used to it's going to take you a second and people understand yeah. that it's going to take you a second and you're okay to mess up right but just but don't acknowledge do it on when you do but acknowledge yeah. and, and even apologize if you think you yeah. right yeah and if you don't make it with the thing. person like they should you should be able to have an yeah. open conversation and be like i'm sorry i didn't mean it in that way yeah. like i think a lot of people get scared that they're gonna get attacked for doing it the wrong way and you're like no no people are not here to attack you like yeah if i'm queer people just want I respect want to, to identify yeah. me as a they them like the, i'm gonna give you the space to to learn how to do that like at least in my own mind like I, I don't know. I have never had to change the way that people address me and my pronouns, but I can't imagine it's easy. But I, at the same time, like you would think like even in your own self, it takes you a second to start to re- refer to yourself in a different pronoun. Yeah. Right. So I just, just yeah. be a kind person. Like that is the very basis of life. Like just be kind. Exactly. Yeah. It's not that difficult. And like another thing I want to add is we need to stop calling them preferred pronouns. They're not preferred. They're necessary. When you meet a cis man, you automatically refer to him using he, him pronouns. That's not what he yeah. prefers. That's what he uses. That's what he is. So we need to get rid of this idea that like, oh, like their preferred pronouns are they, them. It's like, that's just their pronouns. It's quite simple. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. Well, it's, it's an know. interesting point to make too, because like I personally never thought of it that way, right? But it makes so much sense when you say it. And it's like, no, I don't mm-hmm. prefer being called she, like I am she. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's We're just learning. It's and, intrinsic. Yeah. And to bring it back to like to books, I think like a lot of us, because we work in the industry, we kind of get to see this evolution over time of you know, that representation being shown in like a lot of different ways, right? Because I know we talk about it and you see. I see a disproportionately large amount of male male romances versus like female female. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think there's that um, because for some reason that's something that was like projected more and people saw more. So they were like almost more comfortable with that than, you know, whatever. But I do think that you're seeing more diversity. You're seeing more, you know, stuff about gender. And I agree. I think we should do a whole thing on kids books in general, because some of the kids books that have come out recently that tackle like these ideas Mm -hmm. are so incredibly well written Mm -hmm. so and they're subtle which is good like for children like we have one book that is written from like about the stonewall 
like the building and like the gay rights thing. And it's amazing because the whole book is actually written from the perspective of the building. So the building is a character oh, cool. and it's like telling you its history. And it's like, these are all of the amazing things that I've got to see, uh, you know, through the work, through the years. And, you know, this is something I was really proud to be a part of. And it's like, it's so cool. Um, and there's really like cool. another book that talks about the story of Harvey Milk and the invention or like, you know, when he created the pride flag and, but it's talked about like, they don't show sugarcoat anything uh, for the kids which is nice because I think we don't give kids enough um, we don't give them enough credit sometimes in terms of like what yeah. they can comprehend but it's it's done really well so like that representation especially in like kids books it's kind of yeah legit and Shelby and I were just talking about the the picture books um, by Jessica Love I think her name is the Julian is a mermaid and Julian <gasps> yeah. goes to a wedding they're oh, just they're so good. beautiful and they're so <sighs> positive and it's just like it doesn't um like it doesn't uh I can't think of the word underestimate kids because yeah. it's just it just says like oh yeah Julian likes to wear a dress that's what's going on and you know uh Julian's grandmother is totally fine with yep. this and it's just like a positive nice story and it doesn't like stop to say okay kids sometimes you know kids that look like boys wear yeah. dresses it's like it's just this it is, is a character is here you go it automatically yeah, yeah. yeah. kind of beautiful. that's lovely are popular people in like uh, Harry Styles who are starting to, yep. you know, wear dresses oh. in video and shoots and stuff. And like, it's part of popular culture where you're like, it's, it, this is just what it is. Like, yes, they wear a dress. Let's move on. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. why do we have to have a topic, like a whole co- topic of conversation? Like dresses are great. I wear like, like to wear dresses, no pants. Yeah. Great. Like yeah. <laughs> there's continue this, there's on this, with our lives. <laughs> there's this awesome book actually. And it's called, I think it's called Princess Fluffy Bottom. Um, and it's about a cat <laughs> who's oh. Princess Fluffy Bottom. And the book is about the cat. And the cat is upset because the cat's owners are like paying less attention to her and yada, yada, yada. But the coolest thing, my favorite thing about this story is the cat is always like central on the page because it's about Princess Fluffy Bottom. And her owners are always in like the background. You can see them like doing something, but her owners are, are two women. But it's just like, I didn't even notice like the first time I was reading the book because it's like so subtly and well done. And ultimately the owners are having a baby and like Princess Selfie Bottom is sad because she feels like the baby is going to get more attention than her, which I think is like a really valid thing. Like a lot of kids go through that when getting like a sibling or whatever. Even a lot of cat. cats go through it too. A lot of cats yeah. go through that when you yeah. add another kid. <laughs> but the beauty is, and you get to see the evolution of like her parents in the background like moving into a new house and like finding out they're pregnant like the belly growing and all of that and it's just like it's just part of the story but it's a fellow princess fluffy bottom and I just I love that because it makes kids be able to look at a book and realize that that's just normal and that those people are yeah. different look like different than you and yeah. you know what kids literature man Oh, so good. Good it's great honestly think, all the important things are done in children's literature yeah yeah I think we should really like take notes because like adults we find I don't know we have this need to like over explain everything like you know you make a lesbian Christmas movie and there's discourse around it I mean I have my yeah. own personal thoughts about that I'm not gonna lie because why did it need to revolve around queer trauma Kristen Stewart deserved better but also <laughs> at the, I'm sorry I had to get that out there but also Probably at the same it. time it's like when children's authors just put it in a book and they yeah. don't ha- make the kid have a conversation in their head about it it's like you okay because when you have those conversations it's like you feel like you have to justify it yes so mm-hmm we need to stop over explaining so that it's just normal don't stop it. asking yeah. why yeah yeah exactly. which i think no, comes full circle it. with a lot of sorry kate it comes no, Aaron, full go ahead. with a lot of the books that we're reading and how it's it's not about trauma it's just love you know they just like they meet and they find somebody that they like and like that's kind of it like it, you're just like normalizing the relationship in a really good way and the representation yeah. is important mm-hmm with that yeah. maybe you should talk about your book Erin oh but I think Kate has one more poem I think <gasps> oh no that's okay I don't I, I read more of the Billy Ray Belcourt so I was like you know I'll leave Emily Dickinson you can discover her on so her Emily book. Dickinson is a queen um Love her. we all know that <laughs> okay well segueing into uh normalizing just relationships in general i read this awesome book called red white and royal blue and i'm just pulling up a picture for you 
the best book. It's kind of like this. Um, That's my heart. Oh my God, this is the best book. So it, it, the two main characters are Henry and Alex. And um, Alex is a really cool character because he is the first son of the United States. So he's the first son of the United States. He's also uh, Hispanic and his mother is Hispanic and she is the president, which is a world that I would love to live in. And um, Henry, I believe it's Henry, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's Henry. Mm-hmm. The, the, not the king, the prince of England. So he's part of the royal family. So they have like interacted several times because obviously, you know, they're related to the heads of the countries and yada, 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 yada. And they completely, utterly detest each other. Like they do not get along. All they do is bicker. It's absolutely hilarious. The dialogue is witty and on point. Um, so ultimately, um, Alex's mom is running for a second term and she's kind of like, hey, listen, you need to play nice. Like, you know, I want to obviously win again. Um, so they set up this whole fake I don't want to say fake relationship because it's not a fake, fake relationship friendship. trope fake, fake friendship right where they like you know they set up little like meet and greets and they have to like you know hang out in the park and like play whatever and they want the paparazzi to like take pictures and show you know the world that they get along um <laughs> and it's great because obviously there's a very thin line between love and hate and <laughs> they fall for each other and one thing that I love is actually like because Alex his whole life has kind of assumed that he's straight you know until he sort of gets to know Henry and then he realizes that he's bi um, and it's really great and even his mom's response to like when the world finds out that they're dating um not for a second is she like oh this is going to ruin my chance at a second term all she says is it's just like yeah what do you want and I'll stick by you like you make your statement and like I'll stand by you for that too so I, I love that I love the acceptance um I love the diversity I love the fact that it's just a romance and it doesn't matter that they're you know the same gender I just I love it all plus it's so funny it's the so staff. funny it's so they're funny so, they're so fun the yeah turkeys. and I Oh. The, with the turkey oh my god the turkey. the turkey in a cage you all they listeners. get in the most they get in the most ridiculous circumstances no and it's like they mm-hmm. cause all these international incidents and it's <laughs> it's great and I also want to shout out like the author Casey McQuiston or Quiston sorry um she's amazing and she's she has a new book coming out in March probably around the same time that this is going to be released and it's called One Last Stop um and it's a female female romance set in New York City and it's great because like the main character, I can't remember her name, I apologize, but she moves into this house with just like a whole bunch of queer people. And there's like um, like a drag queen that lives across the hall and they go to like drag nights and everyone has like the best names. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, it was really good. It was equally as funny, wonderful representation. Um, so you got to read it. Listeners, please do. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited it. for that one. <laughs> It's really good. And I was good, like, if I could legally share that with you guys. So I read that book early because uh, in the library world and in the publishing world, also there are these things called ARCs, which are like advanced readers copies. Um, and so essentially someone in the industry will email the uh, publisher and be like, please. Um, <laughs> and sometimes the publishers are like, sure. And they send you like an advanced copy of the book. So I read it a couple of months ago. It doesn't come out till March, but I want them so to jealous. keep sending Right, I'm oh. sending me books, so I won't illegally share that document with you. <laughs> but yeah, in case our readers were wondering sometimes why we're mentioning things that aren't out yet, it's because we're special, everyone. <laughs> yeah, we're obsessed. Work in a library. Have... <laughs> well, it's yeah. also not just for us. Like the, the publisher then knows that us as library mm-hmm. workers will uh, have it in the library we'll recommend mm-hmm. it to people but then we also rate yeah. it too and give them like an idea of what we thought of it what didn't work what worked and then even when you're requesting it like you say like oh it's because of the author or it's because of what it looks like like I, all of those things are important for publishers to know and I think us going in and and doing this also helps to create a more diverse repertoire because they're like hey all these librarians only care about our queer fic like maybe we should do more of those like yeah I and think, it's really cool yeah yes it's if, a conversation with readers which is great it is a it is a conversation if, and if our listeners are interested there are two websites one's called Idlewise or Idlewise sorry and the other is called like NetGalley both are great um but yeah and there's usually like two different types you can get you can get the ones that we know are going to be bestsellers and all the publishers trying to do is just sort of generate some buzz before it comes out 
So you get your reviews online. And then there are other ones that like don't even have like a set release date and they want like, they want info. Like they want to know how you felt every step of the way so that they can potentially like go back and do rewrites so that it'll come out and it'll like appeal to a wider audience. So they are very cool. And uh, yeah, yay We're blessed, for that part, honestly. Blessed. We're blessed. We're blessed. <laughs> <laughs> with the ability to do this yeah. cool so instead of my tangent about arcs maybe we should listen to what Absalom read <laughs> oh yeah okay so I read uh this is an older book so we're going back to the Victorian period and this is a horror uh it's called Carmella and it was written by Sheridan Lee Fano it is wild I don't know I love this book I read it in high school and then I read it again in university which was really cool because I actually read it for a course called Victorian Vampires where we read a whole bunch of the classics you know like Dracula all that stuff but it was really cool because we got to do an entire unit on queer vampires and one of the things you'll learn about uh, if you study horror is that a lot of the times, like the, the monsters and the villains that we come up with in, you know, like our cultural consciousness are ways of working out anxieties. So there were, and still are, a lot of anxieties about queerness, uh, especially when it was between women. So it's a really, before I go into a lecture on <laughs> Victorian sexuality, which I would love to, uh, I'll stop myself. But I'll just say that this, it's a novella or a novella. And so it's really short, but it's about Carmilla, who's a vampire. And she moves into this rich family's house. Um, so their daughter's name is Laura. And Laura and Carmilla have an interesting relationship. It's obviously romantic, but it's also extremely parasitic. So the thing about this book is A, it's really good and it's like part of the queer horror canon, but B, it's extremely problematic because it pathologizes queerness. So by pathologizing, I just mean kind of makes it seem like an illness and rather than, you know, yeah. by associating it with monstrosity, the way that Carmilla is this lesbian vampire. And we mm -hmm. see this repeated over and over again, you know, Jennifer's Body, um, an amazing movie, I'll shout it out. Uh, yeah, so what I really, really love about this book is that it was recently turned on its head by uh, a whole bunch of Canadian queer filmmakers. So they turned it into a web series called Carmilla, well, the same name, and they made about three <laughs> or four seasons, and then they made a movie of it, but it's really cool because they, they modernized it, so they put it in a dorm, and they did the roommate trope with Carmilla <gasps> and Laura. And they were roommates. They were did roommates. They, they yes. were roommates. <laughs> yeah. Do they have to share a bed? They didn't, oh, but that doesn't mean they don't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> things happen. <laughs> they didn't, but it doesn't mean they don't. <laughs> yeah <laughs> they didn't have to um but they did they yeah did. so it was just really great to see like you know reading this book and seeing something that could like was honestly like deeply problematic and yeah just just had a lot a lot of issues be like completely turned on its head and it's it's like it's that very like queer notion of like reclamation you know like finding old things from our past that were used against us and then yeah. like turning it into something empowering so I would just highly recommend reading this book or rather watching the web series but I really wanted to talk about that because I don't know vampires are cool and cool. queer people are cool so yeah, yeah but also thing. like like I just kind of want to give a shout out to like because the vampire genre is like one of my favorites because it's like one of the first like horror fantasy like whatever um just like queer baiting in vampire novels yes. as well like let's talk about Louis and Lestat from interview with a vampire and the whole time I was like cool what's going on like <laughs> and Nora and what was her face in vampire diaries they were gone like after a yeah. season basically yeah, yeah. And oh, that's right we haven't got that far and we're my partner and I are doing Sorry. a watch. Oh, no, we've I've already seen watched it, it actually. Okay, okay. I already well, know it's coming. But you're Ooh. right, they were only around no, for panic. one season. Yeah, and that happens a lot. And I think, um, oh gosh, uh, I mean, Jennifer's body is like a whole story. It's, it's cool. I mean, she plays like a canonically 
bisexual um i don't know like she's not technically a vampire she's just kind of like a demon but like yeah, she, she just eats them. boys which yeah fair they and <laughs> i have to plug halsey so halsey um she also wrote this book so technically this is relevant uh, she wrote a poetry collection called i would leave me if i could but halsey is if you don't know her which you should um she is an amazing artist and she's bi um but anyway she wrote a song called killing boys and it's literally like about like it has a deleted scene at the beginning from jennifer's body so she, she just, just watched jennifer's body is like i gotta write a song about this because i get that i think so it's such a good movie that's a mood that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's um yeah that's i'm really so happy <laughs> i'm so happy that like there are so many um books that we brought up though with a uh, bi protagonist because yeah. there's Cause... unfortunately like within the queer community there is a lot of I don't know I don't want to say infighting but like I don't know honestly it's just like phobias like transphobia is huge like you've probably heard of terms which are trans exclusionary yeah. radical feminists and a lot of like terms are I don't yeah. know how you can be a feminist and transphobic, but anyways, um, a lot of TERFs are gay and there's a lot of queer people who like are transphobic or biphobic. So I think it's really important to recognize that just because you're queer, you don't get it like a little getaway free card because yeah. you can still have those prejudices. So it's really important to mm -hmm. like share stories that are not just as, as a lot of people were saying, like not just like two men because that's yeah. kind of the standard and it's great that we're moving past that celebrate falling in love just falling in love is yeah, great yeah. friends and that's why we read all these yeah. romances where they fall in love and have happy we love endings love. because that's what we, we want. do yes, yes. Mm -hmm. tagline we just love love <laughs> yes love love <laughs> precisely yeah forms <laughs> as long as it's consensual yes yeah Anyways, that was a great conversation. I think I had was, so yeah. much fun. There's so many things yeah. to talk about. Like, I wish we could just keep going and going and going. Okay. Thanks, friends. Thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoyed our ramblings. Um, <laughs> we just want to remind you that uh, there's tons of resources on the library, obviously, whether you're listening to us on Spotify or watching us on YouTube. Um, we've also got a Twitter and an Instagram account, and we have a whole bunch of really amazing um, opportunities on our webpage as well. We've got library bundles. You can get staff to put together bags for you full of books that you want to read uh, we've got discover reads forms which are just um, a list of things like tell us what you like and we'll give you a list of books to read so uh, don't forget to give us a shout out if you have questions uh, and take advantage of uh, what we're offering for you we're trying to do you a favor and we hope that we uh, get to see you next week and that you enjoy this and we will talk to you all in a couple of weeks